Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Hey, Bob, good to see you again. Here we are and our part two of this little kind of mini series we're doing here on the healing process. So listeners, if you're joining into this episode, we would encourage you to check out the previous episode where Bob and I just kind of broke down and did an intro into what the healing process is all about. And this episode, we're going to go through the actual steps of like pretty much a generic healing process or an inner healing process that uh, you could do with yourself or you could even do with someone else. So, Bob, any thoughts before we kind of dive into the steps? Yeah, one is, you know, you and I both have been exposed to so many different methods of prayer for inner healing. Yeah. And so this is not a method per se. This is kind of a compilation of what we've learned over the years. And you may recognize, if people are familiar with inner healing prayer, you may recognize different schools in this. But this is something we've kind of integrated and each of us do it in our own way. So there's not a right way to do this. What we're doing is we're trying to dispose our hearts, as the catechism says, to the grace. Hmm. And so the the first part of this is just a disposing. How do we dispose our hearts to be able to receive the grace of Jesus' presence uh, to heal those areas that need to be healed? When you say dispose ourselves, what does that actually mean to you? Like, what what do you think of, or how do you do that? Well. Yeah, that's a question I hadn't thought about. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. So, I think it's like anything else. If I'm if I'm going to visit my family, and I'm in a kind of a closed, unaware place, yes, my capacity to be present to my family, to be intimate with my family, is going to be very different than if I've been in prayer that day. I've been open. I'm aware of what's going on in my heart, and my heart's open and sensitive. Right. And that would be an example of a disposed heart that's open to the Lord. Yeah. Uh, the point you're making that I really appreciate is is the basic principle of self-awareness. Uh -huh. And I would say anything in the, you know, basic growth in the spiritual life and included in that would be inner healing, healing of our hearts. Self-awareness is a critical step. I'm not aware. I mean, I, uh, let me say it this way. It's the most common in my experience that people who are self-aware move along further. I was just talking to one of our mutual friends, Kim, and we were talking about an individual that we were both working with. And I had worked with this individual. And then Kim did this process with this individual. And she made a comment and she she said to the individual, have you done inner healing prayer before? And the person said, no, I, I've just, I met with Jake for about five sessions and we went very deeply into my story, into my life, et cetera. And then Kim said, it was so simple. The process was so simplified. She said, because his awareness was so high of his story, he was connecting to things very quickly, very simply and easily. And so to me, I think that's an interesting point that I think some people might come to this healing process and go, okay, I'm going to sit down in 15 minutes. All my problems are going to go away. That's just not reality. That's not reality. I would even say outside of healing prayer, even in psychotherapeutic treatment of people, there's always a process. There's a way that things work. And when we respect that process and the way that things work, things go a lot better. Just the footnote there, I guess, to that comment would be really what we're talking about there is respecting human nature. If you take care of something, you got to understand it. And so if awareness is a critical precursor to a good, easy, flowing healing process. And that's what I'm noticing you're doing like before you go to your family, you're you've developed the gift or skill or whatever you'd call it of self-awareness so that you can go, hmm, okay, I'm off. I might need to look at that or I'm closed. Like that's a that's an even deeper form of self-awareness as opposed to off. A more specific would be closed. A more specific would be when blank happened, it made me close my heart. That'd be even more specific. All those dynamics affect the healing process. Yeah. 
So let's use that example as it relates to the sacraments. Because, okay. You know, the catechism is over and over saying that sacraments are effective in themselves, but they're subjectively effective to the degree of the disposition of our hearts. That's huge. So we get ready to go to confession. And one time we don't do any self-examination. Yeah. Uh, we don't do any prayer. We just walk into the sacrament and just kind of share what we're aware of. But this grace is still there. We're still going to receive some level of grace. But if we've prepared beforehand and we've we've prayed and we've asked the Holy Spirit to show us, we're going to walk in there with a much more open and the healing is going to be deeper. Right. Same thing if we go to the Eucharist. Same thing if we celebrate the sacrament of our marriage and consummate our marriage. You know, the disposition of our hearts makes all the difference in how we receive the grace of that sacrament. And, and so I think we know that in every area of our life, and it's the same here as we come to pray. Yeah, it's presence, right? right? Like I can't tell you, speaking of marriage, I can't tell you how many times Heather has needed to draw me back to the present moment because I'm somewhere else or I'm thinking about something else, and it impacts the relationship at hand if I'm not present. So obviously, I think that's what we're trying to really highlight here is that that same dynamic and principle applies to this healing process. Everybody wants fruit. Right. Everybody want I want good fruit. And one of the dynamics that we I think I don't know if we we purposefully miss it. I don't think that's very common that people purposefully don't do it. I think there's a lot of just skipping things over that we don't know. But once we know, we can address it and, and then be intentional. So intentionality, self-awareness, understanding, respecting how a process works and how we work, that just amplifies and makes things go a lot better. So Yeah. Yeah, so we could we could actually skip all of the process and just say, Jesus, would you reveal to this person whatever you want to reveal to them? And he will. That's good. But the process is preparing for a deep encounter of the places that need to receive that. Well, that's like a link. I'm glad that you pointed out because as I was sitting with this, knowing we were going to talk about it, I was asking myself the question, why these steps? Why are we doing this, right? I was trying to ask that. And I think the answer is coming in the discussion right now is because this is how human beings and God work in collaboration, right? It's a honoring and a respecting of the nature of what it means to be human. So there's all those psychological truths and principles, and that's connecting with all the truths of who God is and how relationship with God works. For example, free will like why barriers are there, why God doesn't just bust through barriers, like all the, why is it the way that it is? Because there's a way that things work and you respect and honor that. And when you do, good fruit comes. If you don't, don't expect like bursting fruit. You might get a little strawberry once in a while, right? And people are like, <laughs> why didn't it grow? Why isn't it flourishing? Well, there's reasons why, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that's a great example. We've used those examples before, but you're planting a garden. You want to clear the ground get the rocks out. Yep. You know, see where the roots are deep enough, make sure there's enough water. So all that's same with our hearts. You know what's funny as you say that is the first thing that came to my mind when you said prepare the garden is I thought of manure. Uh -huh. And I was like, <laughs> there's a weird natural agricultural principle here that I think is another maybe precursor to this going through this process is the role of the blank in our lives. And a lot of people go, it's bad, it's not there, but if you use it, I mean, it shouldn't be there. Like, I thought God loved me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's an objective truth to that. And yet at the same time, you could apply the agricultural analogy that the manure is a unique capacity to bring about life that non-fertilized soil doesn't have. And it's not pretty, it doesn't smell good, it's not fun to deal with, but it has this unique capacity to draw out life in a way that is different if it wasn't there. And I think the scriptural basis of that is there is more joy in heaven over a repentant sinner than the one who never needed to repent. Yeah. As you talk about all that, my mind's going in lots of places, but I, thinking about all the scriptures about suffering and how suffering prepares our hearts to receive the love of God. You know, Romans 5, 3, I think, 3 to 5. You know, it's like perseverance. Yeah. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, hope, hope does not disappoint because the love of God is poured out. But it's the suffering is the manure that prepares our hearts to hope. And I think you've, I'm sure you've had the same experience over and over again. As I saw people come into my office, I saw how the Lord prepared them yeah. for our time together by all these things that they came in, that they were triggered by, that they were upset by time after time after time. And I would just almost start 
smiling inside, not that it was funny to them, but smiling of, God, you prepared them so perfectly for our time together. And so rather than that be a concern, it became an avenue of the manure that was preparing the soil. <laughs> It's so yeah, and and maybe a, a bridge that we're we're jumping off of from there. That's a, a critical pro- part of the process. The entire way is something that I would call interpretations. Yeah, and so an interpretation is the meaning I put to anything. So the meaning I put to that interaction I had, the meaning I put to my prayer time, the meaning I put to whatever. And so how you interpret the manure has a very important impact on how the process of healing goes. And so if the interpretation is God doesn't love me that will affect the healing process versus if the interpretation is God's up to something, it's hard, but he's up to something good that has a totally different impact, those two different interpretations of the event. Do you want to get into the process or is there something else? Yeah, I was going to say with our friend Kim, who you mentioned a little bit ago, who works with our ministry, yeah, is with us on our priest retreats and other things. She often says, I love triggers. <laughs> and you know, yeah. nobody in the right mind loves triggers, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm not saying Kim's not in her right mind, but she's come to that place of being able to embrace the triggers, the, the events in their life that bring up all this distress because she's experienced over and over again, God using that as a lever yes. to get to deeper healing. And and so if we all of us can start to love our triggers yes. rather than fear them, yes. uh, we can see God healing in that. So this process that we're going to go through isn't just for when you pray. It's for your life. It's it's a way of life. If you can learn to abide in Jesus' love in the midst of stuff that goes on in your life. Amen. So, Bob, there's essentially, if I make it very generic, I'll call it seven steps. And there's a, a kind of a first step that sometimes gets included into the generic other steps, but something that you and I have appreciated over the years. And so how about we'll start with number one. And what we call that is an Emmanuel moment. And, and we took this, this is someone else's work and idea. This is Dr. Carl Lehman and his collaborative work with Dr. Jim Wilder, two people that we really respect and have done a lot of beautiful, powerful work in, in healing. And so Dr. Uh, Jim Wilder really started to realize and study the necessity and need for an initial connection with God before you go into any kind of wound work. And he's really basing this on a lot of the neurological studies that he has done. And he, if for, for therapist people out there, Dr. Wilder was very connected to Dr. Alan Shore, who's a secular, um, I think he's a psychologist, but he studies the development of self through neuro, neuropsychiatry and neuropsychology. So, so he is an expert in the field of neurology. And so Dr. Jim Wilder, who's like a pastor, I guess is the generic way to say it. He calls himself a neurotheologian. That's kind of an interesting phrase. But anyway, basically, generically, he's a pastor and he works with people and he saw the value of the neurological centers of the brain being in the right space and place before you start a healing process. In other words, if you go right to wounds and you're not connected to God versus if you're first connected to God and then go into wounds, the result is quite different. So step one is this Emmanuel healing process. Bob, how about I'll explain it and then I'll ask you to go to step two and then we'll see where we go from there. Is that fair? Great. Sounds great. So the the initial uh, step of an Emmanuel moment or an Emmanuel kind of step one is what you're doing is that you're drawing your attention to God and you're first placing your attention on God. And in a very, very simple, this doesn't have to be complex, and very simply, you're in that connection with God trying to find a time that it's real or a time in prayer, or it could even be an imaginary place or whatever, where you feel a connection with God, where the relationship with God is pretty free flowing and there's no like awkwardness or off feelings. So when I do that, I can think of numerous prayer times and it could be like the one that happened yesterday or like that time where my life changed, I could be either one. And then all I'm doing is recalling that memory and recalling that time or that place or that experience. And in the midst of that, I'm expressing gratitude to God for that particular experience. And what that does neurologically, psychologically, spiritually, is it flips on what they call the relational circuits of the brain, which I think is a really cool way to put it. It's like things start flipping on inside of our soul and our mind, et cetera, that are very important for us to walk through healing, a healing process. So again, this could be, this process could be 
a minute. It could be 10 minutes. And so, again, focusing on a positive experience with God, expressing gratitude, that's a key part of it. The neurological effect of gratitude is very important. And then you're just being there with the Lord. Now, here's what's interesting. Wilder and Layman at times have said, if you get there, you've already accomplished the goal of healing. And, and that's like, what? How, I thought it was bigger than that. And, and the point they're making, which I think is really good, the goal of healing in their minds, and maybe we could discuss this briefly, the goal of healing in their mind is connection with the Lord. It isn't necessarily removal of problems. And that's an interesting spin. I think everybody, well, not everybody, a lot of people come to healing looking for something to change, i.e. their pain, their wounds, their problems. And what they're arguing is that the best thing you can get is a, is a connection with the Lord. Thoughts about that? Yeah, their their work is really good, and people can look it up online. The Emmanuel approach, yeah, and he goes through the process and everything. A couple added things with it is, you know, we we're familiar with this in the Catholic tradition through spiritual direction, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the saints who have led people to reliving the graces, re reencountering the graces, and reliving them, and allowing yourself to experience them, which is part of being reconnected. There is to just to experience the grace, and then as you said, the gratitude. And and even if we don't have an experience where we can think of in prayer, it can even be a human experience of love, of connection with somebody, because God is present in those relationships where there's connection and love. So we can even go back to those natural experiences of feeling connected, feeling loved. That's great. Uh, yeah, very good point. Sometimes people, don't, they wouldn't connect with, they wouldn't have a memory necessarily with God, but that's awesome. The natural ones too. God's there. Yeah. So with the Emmanuel moment having occurred, Bob, what's the next step in the in the process of inner healing? It can go in one of two different directions. One is you can just in that Emmanuel moment ask Jesus to bring you back to a place of distress or a place of woundedness. Yep. Or we as facilitators can say, Let's think of a trigger. Let's think of a moment or a situation in your life where you have distress. And in that place of distress, wherever the event is, again, what's the event that caused it? And then particularly important, what do you experience? So this is kind of the opposite of the Emmanuel moment. The Emmanuel moment where you're experiencing the connection. Here you're experiencing the disconnection. Yes. You know, so what is it you're experiencing there? Fear, anger, hurt, sorrow. Uh, feeling abandoned, feeling alone, feeling rejected, whatever those things are, to really then press into it. Once you've had the connected moment and you have a sense of Jesus being present with you, it's easier to enter into those places with less fear and more awareness, uh, feeling a level of security to go into the places of insecurity. Yeah. And so the, I think the key distinction that you're making there, Bob, is that this is more of a current distress. This isn't like necessarily a historical. So this would be like, yeah, in the past month, last week kind of thing. And and the the principle there is that often we're more aware of the stuff that's happened recently where we've had a significant trigger. And significant is a relative term. We mean I mean it, I'm saying it not objectively. I'm saying everybody's, you know, what is significant is different to everybody. One of the things that uh people throw in here, I've thrown in here is what's called a SUDS rating, and that's drawing from a different therapeutic technique, but it's SUD as an acronym. It means subjective, meaning it's specific to me, units of distress. So it's like a zero to 10 scale. So how distressing is your trigger that you're thinking about that you have that you had last week or whatever? So here's an example. Maybe examples would be helpful. So if I'm thinking about one, the one that comes to mind is Heather and I and the family just got back from a trip. We had to cross the border, which is very normal for us to cross from US into Canada. And when you cross the border, it's a bit of an intense thing. You want to do it right because those guys can wreak havoc on you. And so I gave all of what I thought were the appropriate documents to the guy. And then we got through the border. He let us through. And then Heather said, you were supposed to give him this other thing. And I had all this surge of emotion. And I was like, oh gosh, everything's going to go bad. Uh, I, I was triggered, very triggered. It took me probably an hour to get over that trigger. So that would be a current dynamic that I had emotions. And maybe another question that you, I could have asked myself is, what was I believing about right. myself, about the world, about other people, et cetera, that could have then, we'll, we'll get to those next steps here in a second. But that'd be an example. Is that resonate? 
Yeah, great, great example. Great example. Yeah, it could be a recurrent thing or an event like that, but we have distress. And as you said, it's the belief that's important. It's the belief in the emotion. So it's not just what do I believe abstractly, but when I'm in that emotion, what do I believe? You know, like in that situation, what did you believe in that moment? Oh no, they're going to come after us and this is going to be whatever. It, it's, you know, it's a sense of fear, anxiety, danger, threat. We're not safe. Yes. This isn't, this isn't going to be good. It's going to yeah. go bad. Yeah. Something bad yeah. will happen. Yeah. And so all of those. Yeah. As in this stage of the prayer, if if you're praying this by yourself, as, as you're just trying to identify, okay, what am I feeling and then what am I believing in the feeling? Could be any of them. When we talked about the seven deadly wounds and the identity lies, those are going to pop up in that place. Bob, that is a huge point you're making. I don't know if I've ever heard it articulated so just clearly, but I, I just, for listeners, like I've done this a long time and that is a that is really gold. What are you believing in the feeling? That separation of feeling and belief, I've seen halt the entire process. But when you're in the emotion, what are you believing? And I love the nuance, Bob, because in the psychological world, there's tons of discussion and debate about which is first, the emotion or the belief. And everybody gets caught up in that. But the, the, the point is, it doesn't matter. Yep. They're happening in our minds simultaneously. So you're working with both of them. Yep. What's the belief in the emotion? Uh, what's the emotion while you're having that belief? That that's saying either way, right? So that's really cool. Okay, so we've got a manual moment. That's a connection with God. It's kind of a good starting point. You're turning on the relational circuits with the Lord. Then you're going into what is my current distress? Now we we mentioned that side example of you could just jump right into Lord, what do you want me to know right now? What's the root? What's a problem? We're going to go through the more detailed process. So step one, a manual moment. Step two, identify the current distress. That's what we just described. Okay. So step three this is pretty simple. Step three, ask Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, ask God to show you the root of that distress. Another way to say this, where did this, where does this come from? So Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Father, Show me the root of this. Now, there's a critical distinction here that, again, a lot of people, oh, maybe we can talk it out. We're asking God to show us the root as opposed to asking myself to show me the root. Yes. And that, again, I've seen have all kinds of different results yeah. based on who actually is asked and who actually is, answers. So a, a little tip here, don't try to figure it out. And that's really hard to do. That can actually bring up a barrier, potentially of self-reliance. So, any thoughts about step two there, yeah. or step three? Yeah, it's one of the things as therapists and as people who've been in therapy, we're used to trying to figure those things out and analyze those things and all that. And that's really where stepping back from our own self-reliance and and really trusting God in this process. And so sometimes. We have so much self-protection that we want to figure it out because we don't want something to come. And so sometimes it's a process of being able to relax enough and trust enough to be able to let God show us and to trust that he will show us. You know, Because yes. if we have wounds in relation to God's not here and he's not going to show me anything, we talked about that last time, then we're going to get anxious in that and want to figure it out. My experience is almost before we have the opportunity to think, he's already revealed it. Yes. It's like, it's what's that first thing that comes, you know, and even if it feels vague and dim, or it could be a series of memories, could be we've seen even back in the womb, or it could be something generationally, it could be any number of issues that come up then, but we're not trying to figure it out. Uh, it's, you know, like use the example that you just gave about what happened at the, at the border, at yeah. crossing the border, yeah. you know, and maybe the Lord reveals some moment of, threat that you weren't even aware of that felt like that. And all of a sudden, the beliefs match up with what that current event is. And you say, okay, I don't know about this event, but it certainly matches my experience. That's so true. The The difference, like right there, I could ask myself about the border one and go, I know the answer of what I think should come up times with authority figures where I got it wrong and wounds around that. But that's the distinct, that's really important is that the Lord might not bring that up. And I've, I have so many experiences of people going, I think it's this. And something in me as the facilitator went, 
I think that might be you. Let's just make sure we turn to the Lord and ask him and something out of the blue comes up and they go, this doesn't make any sense at all. Well, let's just trust and stay with it. And they're like, holy smokes. You know, this, is like, <laughs> this was yeah. huge, you know? Yeah. Okay. So that was the the step three. Um, and so now step four. So we, we, we've got a manual moment. We've identified a current distress. We've asked the Holy Spirit to show us something. So again, there's almost like, you know, you know, those charts that has like, I think it's called a decision tree. Like there's, yeah. you can see yeah. those online. So this is another decision tree moment. So if you've asked and nothing comes up, then you're probably dealing with a barrier. And we're going to get to that here in a little bit. But if you ask and a memory comes up, go with it. Yeah. So just footnote, we're going to talk about barriers here in another step, but barriers can come up at any point along the way. So we just did step three. So step four, identify the painful experience and corresponding belief. This is very simply, I've, I've identified the current distress dynamic. Now I'm identifying the historical or root dynamic. And I would say the concepts are pretty similar. It's what is the emotion and lie or belief. Uh, sorry, I emphasize lie. Lie is simply a belief that isn't true. That's all a lie is, is it's a, I believe something that's not true. Now there's all kinds of nuance, but I'm trying to simplify. So identify the painful experience and corresponding belief. So let's say for a moment, just for example's sake, that uh, I pray and I don't ask myself, but I ask the Lord. And then I go back to, I'm just going to see the first one that comes up. So here's one that comes up. I'm in grade three or four, maybe I shared on the podcast, and I'm I'm at a dock swimming with my friends and some guys come along and push me in the water. We've talked about this one, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting that that one popped up right away. Yeah. I don't know what it is yeah. about this event. Um, anyway, so they were a bit older and they pushed me in the water. So the emotion is fear. Uh, there's nobody around that's going to help it go okay. And the belief I have would be like, this is really bad. Something bad's really going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. This could go really awful. These guys are going to hurt me, but I'm I'm terrified, and then I'm ashamed at the same time that I'm terrified. So, again, those there would be some examples of that. So that's just a pretty simple one. That's pretty easy. Bob, you mentioned something I think that's important for people to know is that you can have memories pop up, and this is where it's handy to have psychological background that are pre-verbal, mm -hmm. and so people go, "I don't see a memory." I can't even say what's going on. I just have these really strong emotions. That's one something for me, I usually go, huh, we're probably dealing with a pre-verbal memory, a memory that you were very, very young, so you didn't have the capacity to think in words yet. And you you're, you were pre-pictures even neurologically, but the emotions were there. Any thoughts more about step four here, identifying painful experience, corresponding belief? Yeah, several things. One is people experience differently. So as you're describing, some people have strong sense of feeling, some people have thoughts, some people have images, some people just have a sense of something. And so it's trusting the way that you experience it, not trying to experience it a different way. You know, like you might be in a, in a memory like that visually. visually yeah. That's common for me. And I might just have a, a sense of that, you know, just the difference in the way we're wired. Yeah. We talked about that last time in terms of imagination. I may not have the imagination of that entered into, but I just have this sense of revelation of this is where the Lord's showing. And so it's just being open, not trying to evaluate how I'm hearing or what I'm hearing, but just going with what we're receiving. And then like in the beginning is to allow ourselves to enter into the experience of it, mm. just like we did with the other steps, and to be present there. And again, be present there with the knowledge of Jesus that we started with, that we're not there alone. Yes. Even if we feel alone. Yes. That he's present with us. And so we can look at this, we can feel this, and then we can explore. And and one of the questions I often ask at that point is, Holy Spirit, what do you what do you want them to know about this memory or series of memories? And if it's a series of memories, it's not having to go to every memory, but what's the common denominator? What's huh. What's the thread that runs through these memories? What's the f common feeling and common experience? When you're asking about the Holy Spirit, what do you want them to know? I, I'm I'm assuming you're not going on to the next step. I think what I'm hearing no. you say is you're unifying data. You're unifying experience. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, because as you mentioned it, you know, you may have first of all been aware of the fear. Got it. Then the Holy Spirit wanted you to feel the shame and the powerlessness. And, and so if we run fat, past that too quickly, 
there's going to be information there of your mind and heart that would get missed. Bob, there's something I think important here that I've seen you done in the in the in the conference work that we've done, where there's a toleration. I think that's where there's a tolerance uh, of distress for a time, so that the full dynamic can come to the present, can come to awareness, right? And man, I, I, again, I've seen that be you know where you pull out half the root of something, and it's haste or it's it doesn't always work perfect like i i I have this tool that gets weeds and stuff out of my yard and it's just something i do and it's like this meditation for me of what healing is like and it doesn't always come out easy the tool doesn't always work it doesn't grab it perfectly and there's times it does and it's like yes it was beautiful look at that it's all gone and i like eat that you stupid root you know (laughs) but there's other times where it takes it doesn't work and i have to use different dynamics so i just feel like that that's an important thing if if you don't slow down and really let the Holy Spirit reveal all that's there and skip over this, you could get half, it could be like two, it's patchwork, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Like a part of the a weed being hidden underground and you don't see it. Then it grows back. It grows back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, that, yeah. It just makes me laugh. I have a spot in my yard where I put all the dead weeds and I put them all together and it just gives me joy. I'm like, all you are dying together. <laughs> you were never intended to be here, and I will expose you to the light, and you will burn. <laughs> Sorry, <that's it. laughs> the exterminator, huh? Jake, the exterminator. Sorry, I don't know what's going on right now? But anyway, I'm like, it's like it's in my bones. I can't help but get out the the problems. Of the okay, so identify the painful experience. That was step four. Now we're going to step five, and that's the nuance I was I was making a bit earlier with with what you were saying. So, Bob, step five: ask Jesus to reveal what He desires you to know. That's different than what you just said. So, what what's distinct about this now? Step five. This is where we're praying for some encounter, the way that the Lord desires for that encounter to happen, and it's almost always a surprise when this comes. Never what people expect, and that's part of how you know it's the Lord. It's just just comes and he just surprises us with his love. And it's usually two things that I'm listening for and watching for, is how does the person experience love, which is the healing of those areas of woundedness, and how does the Lord express, how does a person experience the truth from the Lord, which heals the distortions and identity lies. Amen. And so I'm listening for that, not trying to construct it. I'm not trying to lead the person at all. I'm just listening to what the Lord is revealing to their heart that's good. And they will have a felt sense, one way or another, of the Lord's love and a sense of a revelation of truth, however that comes. That's good. Uh, again, examples. Uh, I can think of numerous times where, as a facilitator, we get to this point, you know, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, what do you want, what do you desire this person to know? And uh, uh, sometimes it's like a picture. There aren't words. Yeah. They say, Jesus is just sitting with me now. And then they're, you know, you're just great. Let's just let that sit there. And then they're like, I don't know what's happening, but I don't feel angry anymore or afraid anymore. Awesome. That's it. And then that sometimes that's it. It's just like they there's a picture. There's other times where there's not a picture in words or a picture and words, or like you said, just a felt sense. Like it just I just sense that it's different. Mm-hmm. Again. Anything that's true, good, and beautiful, uh, there's a little bit of discernment that's required here, and that's valuable for the facilitator or the person doing it with themselves to have a little bit of awareness of discernment. I've found the discernment of spirits formation to be exceptionally helpful right here. I have that in the back of my mind. I've literally at times had the rules of discernment sitting on my desk when I've been doing this, like if, especially on Zoom. Uh-huh. And I'm just listening to what they're saying, and I'm looking at consolation and desolation, the rules for consolation and desolation. And it's very, they're very simple. And I go, yep, that, that fits. So I'm just letting it be. You know. Any other thoughts there about the asking God to reveal what he desires them to know? Step five? Yeah, so, some people in that experience won't see Jesus, won't hear Jesus. They'll just feel a release of whatever was going on. And then when you go back, and this is later step, but when you go back and check the original distress, the original distress feels different too. And so you can trust it even if there's not a a, a verbal, mental, or a visual encounter there. Yeah, God doesn't always have to work the way we want him to. 
Yeah. He he can he can and does heal in the ways that are best. And that isn't always easy to trust because it's like, I want words. I need you to tell me, you know, and there's sometimes where he doesn't and and that though it not going the way that we want can be formative. It can also be healing. It can also expose other things that need to be addressed. Yeah. I, I shared this story with the patrons last time. Yes. About Patrick. And yes. when he got to this point and Jesus came, he came to his father, which made him really angry yeah. rather than to him. But it was so clearly the Lord because of what happened after that. And so sometimes it's not at all what we, oftentimes it's not at all what we expect or what we think we want. And then yes. the healing that comes from it is evidence. And and the, exactly, the healing, which would to root that biblically would be the fruits. Like uh, right. we're blending analogies, I think, a little bit. So don't get confused, listeners, about is it what fruit are you talking about? Th this is, it, <clears throat> Jesus says, you will know a tree by its fruits. And so what we're looking at is if Jesus is present and it, it's actually him that's active, you will see fruit, peace, Patience, kindness, gentleness, so the fruits of the Spirit. I f have the capacity to forgive the person now or whatever. There's good fruit that's present wherever Jesus goes. <clears throat> and so if there's no fruit, it makes you question, okay, hmm, let's question that. Let's maybe press back in. If there's abundant fruit, awesome. Okay, cool. Let's see if that fruit lasts. Does it last for a month? You know? Yep, which is down to the last step, you know, skipping over barriers. That's where we test out that fruit. Yes. And you go back to the original distress and see if both in the memory and in the original distress, there's that freedom. Okay. You know, so that I talk a lot about the, the opposite of the seven deadly wounds are these seven signs of healing and, and testing them out. That's Yeah, awesome. So listeners, if you're following along, uh, we just talked about step five, where ask the Lord to reveal you what he desires you to know, pictures, truth, et cetera, release of pain and inner knowing. We just skipped six. We're going to talk about it in a second, and that's barriers. But barriers is kind of this off, it's kind of on its own on the side, because barriers can come in at any step at any point along the way. But it's common to have it happen right here, because when you're asking Jesus to reveal what he desires you to know in that, that root memory or root dynamic, that's often where barriers come up, uh, and that's pretty common. But then you mentioned step seven, Bob, which was checking it out. And the, the key is, is there positive fruit? Is there release? Is there peace? Is there freedom in the root as well as the, the current distressing dynamic? So for me, is there peace or is there fruit in the memory at the dock? And when I think about crossing the border again, yes, that's a really po a valuable test. And if there's not, uh, in my experience, we go back to either the current distress to see if there's some other emotion that's now coming up or go back to the root dynamic. And again, how do I know where to go? How do I know what step to do? Jesus is the healer. It's very simple. An awareness of the process is valuable because you can turn back and say, you know, Jesus, I'm not experiencing anything. Uh, where should I go now? I feel like Jesus, uh, I want to go back to the the current distress. Jesus, is that where you want me to go? And then you're sitting and waiting. So it doesn't have to be like where you're sitting there like anesthetized dead on the table, right? There, there can be cooperative <laughs> dynamics going on with you and the Lord. Sometimes we need to be anesthetized on the table because we're like, don't go there. Get your hand out of there. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so Bob, anything else with uh, kind of step seven with checking the fruit? Then let's go back and spend a little bit of time with barriers. Anything else with step seven? No, it, it's just always so much fun when when you been with somebody in their distress and there's an encounter with Jesus and you just see this change on their face yeah. if you're there facilitating and it goes from this pain to this joy, this sense of disconnection to connection. I mean, it's just like there's so many visible manifestations that you say this person isn't making this up. You know, they're, they're experiencing something real. And as you test it out, you realize how real it is and that that reality stays over time. There, it may need to go deeper. It may be other aspects that need to be healed, but there's the fruit of healing remains. Amen. So Bob, let's talk about what we have listed as step six, but again, it can apply to almost any of the other steps. And that's uh, if, if something's not going right, if, if the whole process is stopped, if it's really clunky, if it feels like you're walking through mud, 
if everything's totally blank and and that's distressing, we're pro- we probably have a barrier involved. And now there's different kinds of barriers, and I'm just going to list some of them. And again, people might be going, "What? Why? Do, why does this? Why is that a barrier?" This is a great realization of how human nature works, and the author of human nature, God Himself, respects His own design. He respects His creation, and so He doesn't go against what He has created in the normal way that He's created. So, first of all, one of a, a very common barrier would be a vow. So, if this, if this is the first time you're hearing the word vow, we encourage you to go back and listen to the Anatomy of a Wound series. So, a vow is a promise or something that you've made to yourself about how you will guard and prevent any of the wounds from happening again. And it could be, here's a vow we see a lot, I won't let anyone get close to me. I won't trust anyone. Well, to experience and receive healing from the Lord, it requires closeness. It requires trust. And if you've made a vow after this wound, I won't ever do that, that can stop and halt the entire process. You'd be sitting there going, I've asked Jesus to come, but nothing's happening. And it could be because you forgot the vow, but Jesus didn't. Um, So that's a, a vow. Another one would be a judgment. So again, it, go back to the Anatomy of a Wound series. That's a type of belief. So again, we're referencing old stuff that we're hoping that you're familiar with. Another one could be a lack of forgiveness. Another one could be an unconfessed sin. People often go, what? Come on, I thought God can bypass that stuff. No, he respects the entire ontology, big word that basically means our being and our essence, our entire ontology of what it means to be a human. So Bob, any other thoughts? What, what are you thinking when it comes to barriers? Yeah, let's go back to to vows for a second. And one of the ways that manifests is in control. You know that that I'm in control, and so even in this prayer process, when I have a hard time letting go of control, there's probably some deep rooted vows there. That just as you mentioned, I'm not going to trust anybody. I'm going to I'm going to take care of this myself. I'm going to figure it out, and you know it ties in with our defenses. Our, our psychological defenses, but these defenses are fortified by these vows yes. or by these judgments. Yes. And it could be that we're just not ready yet, and what we need is to go back and experience more of an Emmanuel moment. And one point. of the things I do when barriers come up is, you know, very rarely, we talked about this last time, very rarely do I ask Jesus to take that away because it's violating the person's human will, unless the person's willing and ready and their heart's ready. Uh, I may ask the person to renounce it if they're ready. Yes, very good. Or I may ask Jesus just to be present to the person where they're not ready. That's so good. Where they they feel fear or insecurity around that, because you know we have what some other models call you know like heart sync. My yes. friend Andy Miller calls uh, guardians. You know places places in us that are protecting and guarding, and and they're there for a reason. They're there because we couldn't handle. We, things. And so even though those are made out of vows, we don't just try to push past those vows. We may just come and be present to those vows. Bob, that, man, there's so much that you just said. So listeners, if you're sitting there going, oh, okay, got it. No, nope, you probably didn't get it because Bob just laid out, sorry, I mean that respectfully, but Bob just laid out some absolute gold right there, being present to a person as opposed to just busting through a vow, renunciation, like those are not necessarily quick little snap of a finger approaches. You can sometimes, I, I don't know about you, Bob, I've spent sometimes with people more time in the vows than I have in anything else, more time working on barriers than anything else. And when the barriers aren't there, the process goes really quick. Here's one of the really ways quick. I've seen that with kids. Yeah. I've seen kids do this process, especially younger kids, very, very simply. It's it almost feels weird how easy it is for them. And the more that I've I've thought about it, as I've gone right, they have very they have way less barriers. They haven't developed in the psychological world what we would call coping mechanisms. Their dissociation isn't doesn't have decades of work and buildup, et cetera, that's gotten in there. Bob, you mentioned renunciation. Can you break that down a little bit more about what that is and why that applies here? Yeah, these can be any number of barriers that we we need to renounce. And I don't know if we've done a series on renouncing, but maybe we need to if we haven't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we do this at all of our conferences, and things like Unbound talk a lot about renouncing, uh, Unbound Ministries, and it's just the same thing we do on Easter Sunday. You know, we renounce Satan and all his works, and we announce the truth of who God is and what we believe. And 
And so we've been given that authority in our baptism. That's awesome. And here we're just exercising it in specific ways mm. where we've been deceived by the enemy, where we're where we're trusting in something other than God. And it, it's just very simple. Be let's say we have that vow of I will not trust anybody. I would just lead somebody, or if it's for myself, just pray this way in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce. Why don't I just lead you in this? And okay, we'll just. Do this in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. I renounce the vow. I renounce the vow. That I'm going to take care of myself. That I'm going to take care of myself. And not trust anybody. And not trust anybody. And I give you permission, Holy Spirit. And I give you permission, Holy Spirit. To bring me into freedom in this area. To bring me into freedom in this area. Okay. And then I might add an, an, an announcement of truth, like I acknowledge the truth. I acknowledge the truth. That you, Jesus, are trustworthy. That you, Jesus, are trustworthy. And that if I invite you, you will come. And that if I invite you, you will come. Okay. And then we just stop as we pray that and just pay attention to what the person's experiencing. We don't rush through, but just, yeah. okay, what do you experience after that? You know, Bob, I really appreciate the the, the double, the, the two-pronged thing of renounce and announce. Uh -huh. I've done in my work of myself, I, I think I've erred on the side of renounce and not enough announce. And the interesting experience of it is that you can feel empty. Mm -hmm. It's weird. I have this experience. I'm pretty self-aware and I have a pretty good awareness of my internal world. I can't always explain what's going on, but I can feel it. I can sense it. And so it's weird. I've gone, what? This feels better, but it doesn't feel complete. Uh -huh. And it's like I dug out the weed, but I didn't put the flower back in its place or the healthy grass or whatever. And it just is like a hole that's there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good description. And I, I love what you're saying about just, even if I can't identify it, I can feel it. Yeah. Right. And just to allow people the time to be in touch with what they're experiencing. Yes. Because it's revelatory. Amen. You know, it's, it's, it's saying something about an experience. Yeah. Bob, I, I think I can imagine the listeners going, I don't have those awesome words like what Bob just said. And I think something that could be worthwhile and valuable is for people to check out other resources that you have. I think on Halo, you guys have done a whole, you and sorry, you guys, I'm talking about you and Sister Miriam, have done, haven't you done a whole thing on renunciation? Like you listed and prayed through those or something? Yeah, we did uh, all the deadly wounds. We went through and did meditations and renouncing and announcing prayer. That resource is amazing. When we when we do our events, when Sister, you and I are all together, and it this is always an important and I think powerful time. Renunciation is a powerful thing, and so I think where people struggle is they don't have the words, they don't know, they don't yet know how to lead themselves through it or someone else. And it's okay to piggyback. I call it piggybacking. You're just you're just hopping on to Bob's experience, Sister's experience. You're letting them walk you through it. And you're just getting a piggyback ride through this little section. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out that. And those people who've come to the conferences uh, with Bob, they're, they're, those are in your workbook. All those kind of scripts, that's maybe not the right way to say it, but yeah. it's like how to pray it. They're in the workbooks. And then some of the books also have them like uh, Be Restored and Be Transformed also have the renouncing in the back in the appendix. In the appendix. Okay, very cool. I, I would highly recommend that as a, a way to address barriers. It, it's actually amazing. And uh, it, I think the reason that it's amazing for me when I've done it with myself or I've done it with people is I underestimate the power of, of interpretations, agreements, uh, signing on the dotted line with the enemy. I, I, I just go, oh, you know, that's kind of like froofy or oh, that, that's just like fairy tale stuff. But it's amazing how transformative I, you can literally see and feel stuff shift yeah. from simple prayer, but it's accurate. You know, it's like, whoa, I didn't expect that. But it, it's it's real. Yeah. yeah. And our on our Friday nights of our Healing the Whole Person conference, we do a demonstration of this and then we lead the whole group in through these renouncing prayers and announcing prayers. And I ask people to, you know, raise their hand if you felt something shift. And it's like the majority of people yeah. have experienced the shift just by us praying that together. Yeah. Do you, Bob, when you're when you're praying, maybe this is a question for here, but the entire process. How about let's let's end with this? We had another idea, but I think we'll we'll talk about maybe doing that elsewhere because I'm looking at the time. But so that was a teaser for people like, what are you gonna do? You'll have to stay tuned. <laughs> so <laughs> the uh uh when you're talking about like 
the the sense that you're having in the moment. Now, I, I know you quite well, and I know that you know you can sense what the Lord's doing. I think in your life, you probably sense it more for other people than yourself. That's my experience of you. Like you dial into other people quite quickly, and you'd probably struggle more with hearing what's going on in your own heart. Yeah. But you trust that. Like uh, even when you were doing the renunciation with me, my hunch is you you that's true. You were where did the words come from? Like how how did you know what to say? Like in other words, you're also present in that process with people, and there's a fine line I think with regard to where do you insert yourself and where do you not? And how do you know what to say? And this is something that therapists know very, very intimately is how present should I be? How much do I bring myself to the table? Blah, blah, blah. So any thoughts there for this barriers, but the whole process? Yeah. Barriers may be the place where people have a hard time seeing and hearing for themselves because they have barriers. Yeah, good point. But one of the things I'm trying to do as I'm listening for barriers, is listening to the words that come out of people's mouths into the places where they're stuck. And so oftentimes it's not mystical in a sense of I'm getting a revelation. Sometimes I am, yep. but sometimes I'm just hearing them express. And Jesus says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if I'm listening well and in listening with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is highlighting, uh, there's a vowel right there that that's a belief system right there. And I may not say it in the moment, but when we get to the place where we're, where the person is stuck and I'm then asking the Lord, you know, where's the barrier that would come back and say, okay, this is a place that we need to do that. Sometimes it is the Lord given the revelation and, and the person hasn't said it. You know, like again, we reference Kim. Kim gets a lot of a lot of a reference yeah. here. She's got the red phone. Yeah, she's on the red phone a lot. You know, when I've prayed with her lots side by side with people. And she'll be in, in all our conferences, the priest conference stuff, ministry training. She'll be demonstrating intercessor role, yep. and so she'll have all of this revelation that the person hasn't had yet, and she's just waiting patiently to the right moment to be able to share it. And it's just amazing. It's just it's pure gift. Yes. And then both you and I will have that at moments, but with her, it's such a well developed gift. It's just yeah. amazing. You know, I think something that's funny here is that uh, I've had people go. Oh my gosh, how did you know that? And and these kind of moments. And internally, I just was like, I was just listening. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I was just really trying. People are like, it's amazing. Yeah. You have this incredible gift. And it's like, it's cool. I'm just listening. You yeah. know? Yeah. So people think it's uh, a supernatural gift to pay very deep, close attention to people. And there's a little bit of overlap there, but it's pretty natural. Just people love being cared for and attended to. And I'm very similar to you. There's I've gotten way more way further with people just paying attention than I have receiving revelation. Kim can do both really well. So yeah. any kind of final thoughts here as we as we wrap this up? Anything that's coming to mind kind of to land the plane? No, just to say that also in some of our material, we have this process written out in, in some of the background. So hmm. if people want to go deeper into that, again, in Be Restored, I have this in the appendix and talk about it in the book. And yes. Healing the Whole Person, we have this outlined and people can go through it. So you know, just if you have a desire to go deeper, there's an opportunity. But also, just on the basis of this, I think probably for most people, there's stuff that's coming to their mind as we're talking. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. You know, where do you go with that? And I would say just re listen to this and go back through the process. Just go and experience the Lord, connection with the Lord. And then just, just ask Him to speak to your heart. Bob, I really appreciate that last comment about that's the value of podcasts and the pause button, right? right? Like you can you can listen and go, okay, yeah, 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 and pause. I, I've done this with podcasts and teachings before where I've taken an episode like what we've just done and I've written out the process for me on, a, on you know, typed it out usually on my computer and then I have it there and then I put it in my own words so I understand it and then I, I will take myself through the process, but I have all the steps right there before me so I don't have to think and remember. And so I've I've done this before with the discernment of spirits materials and Father Timothy Gallagher and those guys that I've I've literally typed out all the stuff so I don't have to think about it in the moment and I can just go oh is it this is it this is it this so hmm. that's maybe something that people really want to do is do a little bit of homework here so that you have it and Bob I think you know it's it's after you know I've been you've been doing this a lot longer than me but we both are at a point where we don't need the sheet in front of us and 
getting to that level of familiarity is really valuable because you can pick up just in conversation with somebody where they are in the process. You know, like it's it's amazing when it's just very familiar and you can do it with yourself. Like here's just a quick tip for people. Like I, I, I'm, I'm in a meeting and I'm triggered and I, I don't have 30 minutes or an hour to go through the process. What do I do? And, you know, my encouragement to you there is make note. I call it bookmarks throw in a bookmark and just say, I need to come back to that section in my story. Mm. Another very quick one is that, you know, you're in the moment, you just, Lord, I ask you to come into this. I, I, you know, I can't deal with it right now, but please, Jesus, I give you permission into this area. Yes, I have a hunch that, uh, God willing, I get to heaven that I'm going to see all these little times that I made that prayer. And he's going to go, that made a big difference when you just, it's, you know, many healing processes. Yeah, a great application. And you get to the point where in the middle of the meeting, you're praying like that, and you're able to just get back to peace pretty quickly. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, t- yeah, it's very true. Listeners, we, we hope this episode blessed you. There's just a lot here. So I really want to encourage you to, to go back and re-listen. And we also want to encourage you to check out Patreon. Bob and I are dependent on your support to keep the podcast going for all the stuff that goes on. And the patrons get special content. So they're actually going to get a special background kind of breaking down of this episode and a special handout and stuff like that. So I think I'm saying that, Bob, just to be explicitly like kind of drawing them over. Um, so your support in Patreon is very helpful. You can go to our website to check out the show notes for this episode and everything else, restoretheglorypodcast.com. We're grateful for you. We're grateful for the journey, and we're looking forward to some fun upcoming series that we've got going. Until next time, God bless you guys. Mm-hmm.